So uh, thanks for joining us today for Google Cloud Platform. Uh, they've partnered with GoCode Colorado to provide access to their platform, which you can utilize for your GoCode Colorado submission. Um, I'm proud to have James Ward joining me today from Google to cover their platform and the resources he's put together. I'll pass it over to you, James. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, thanks all of you for joining me today. So I'm James Ward. I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud. And so I just help developers learn about what Google Cloud is and, and how to use it. And it's uh, it's definitely a huge product with a lot of different pieces and everything from runtime environments to run your applications and backends to uh, data analysis tools like BigQuery to AI stuff to data storage so all sorts of different pieces of the the platform um, i focus mostly on the the compute pieces uh, i'm a traditionally a java developer do you java kotlin and scala and um and so so that's where i focus most of my energy but i'm fairly familiar with with most of the products under google cloud so any questions you all have with with anything i can uh, hopefully answer answer those or point you in the right direction um, so for, for uh, this event, I put together three videos about containers. So containers are um, really a tool that, that are they're for the packaging and running of applications on Google Cloud or elsewhere. And they're, they're kind of like zip files if you're not familiar with them. They just contain everything that's needed to run uh, your code somewhere. And you can run that locally in Docker or you can run it on cloud services like the Google Cloud Run service, or you can run it in Kubernetes, or we have a managed Kubernetes called uh, Google Kubernetes Engine. So lots of different places to run them, but containers have kind of become the, the uh, de facto standard for how you have something you've packaged up and is portable and can run in lots of different places. And so there's three different videos that I put together. One is just the basics of containers, what they are, how to use them locally, what, what are container registries. Uh, and then the second one is about how to create containers with something called build packs. There's a number of different ways to create containers, but uh, I really like build packs. They're, they're nice and easy. And um, so I did a, a video on that. And then the third video is on how to deploy containers and so this is about um, using Google Cloud with Cloud Run. And then I also talk a little bit about um, Kubernetes as well. So, um, so that's what I went through in the three videos. We do have some uh, credits for you to use on Google Cloud. Um, I think we did five, yeah, $500 of credits. Um, so for a lot of uses, that should be a, enough to get you going. And, and um, you know, if, if for some reason you need more uh, than that, you're diving in and doing some some big awesome stuff and you're gonna win uh let me know and i can see if i can get you some more credits um but but hopefully that 500 dollars is is enough to get you started um so yeah that's that's kind of the background on on what we put together for uh go code for this year and i'm happy to answer any questions you all may have about containers or google cloud or anything <laughs> i can talk about skiing as well so <laughs> I'm going to dive in with, oh, hey, hello. Oh, you're on mute. Hi, how are you? Good. Hey, Thanks for joining us. Yeah, go ahead. You, you can go ahead first, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, mine's a pretty basic question. So um, maybe I will just take the lead with the basic question and get you warmed up there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so. I have been using um, a container, I, so I have Docker installed and I've been um, working with geospatial libraries. And so uh, GDAL, GDAL is a library that I've been working with. And so, um, you know, I started by downloading the, um, the smallest, uh, you know, build that I could find. And um, it, it didn't have all of the run functions that I needed in GDAL, it was more compressed. So then I went and I yeah. installed the medium you know, size container. And so listed in that, uh, in the drive packages was the, the tool that I needed to extract the data types that I was specifically after. Um, and so as I ran the extract function on the container, I had a failure saying still that that driver didn't exist. 
And, you know, then I went through and I just re-ran it like on my local machine being like, you know, am I losing my mind? <laughs> so it ran on my local machine with the just install of VDAL on my local machine. So in that scenario, would I try to modify the, the, the medium build pack that said it was, you know, containing the driver that I had? Or would I actually just need to go back to the, you know, browse again and find a different build? Yeah, so what often happens is that when people create containers, they they create containers in a specific way. And the one of the concepts of containers is that they're they're immutable. And so uh, once you start a container, you're starting with the configuration that they gave you. And so it can be hard to then like override the configuration for what you need need it to do. There depending on the, how the container has been created and the kind of override hooks that they give you, you may be able to, to do something on container startup with an environment variable or with some file that you, that you copy into the container to override some configuration. Um, so that's, that's one possible way to go. That, if, there are, if there is a way to do that, it would probably be in their documentation, hopefully be in their documentation. If you can't figure out a way to do it like that, then your alternative is to create a new container that does the that does the special configuration that you need or changes something about the container. And this can actually be a good place to use a Docker file, which I didn't talk about much in the how you create container side of things. Um, but the Docker file is the traditional way to create containers. And what you do in a Docker file is you say, all right, start from this container image. So you'll say from, and then whatever your medium container image uh, that you're using was. And then you provide a series of instructions for what to do to modify that container. And so you'll say like, all right, I want to run this command and or I want to copy in this file or whatever it may be. And then the output of, of running that Docker file is a new container that has that starting container plus your modifications on it. And so, so it may be that you need to, that, you, that would be kind of the more low level way to handle this is to, to modify their container by starting with it, making some changes, and then that the output of that when you run Docker build is is your new container that would have your changes in it. The, the best way to kind of experiment with that is hopefully the container has bash in it. And so if you run like Docker run minus IT, the container name, and then slash bin slash bash, then hopefully you can get into a bash prompt in the container. And then you can test out like what changes do I need to make to this thing in order to get it into the state that you need it in. Um, and then and then from that, you can take basically the what you've done and turn it into a Docker file so that then you have more reproducible way to, to get to that container, that modified container. Awesome. Is that? that sounds like a very clear path forward that I would be successful with. And I and it's really <laughs> just like, what's the right way to do it? You know? Um, so. Yeah. So I'm definitely going to turn that out. Cool. Yeah, there's definitely been a number of times where I had to create my own container to, to modify some base image um, because I, that, I had to go lower level uh, to get the changes that I needed. Uh, and it's good to know that, that it really is that customizable, especially if you're willing to like think about it you know, from a different, like, how do I make it work? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Nice thing about Docker is that it's just containers like all the way down. And so uh, <laughs> until you get to the what's called scratch is the base container. And so yeah. you can always just start from scratch and put whatever you want in. But but usually you start with a container image and then you're, you're really just adding layers in, on top of that container image to create a new container image. Um, so it's it, it is kind of a nice model of of immutable kind of modifications of a base image. And then you can always pick any layer that you want because they all have a SHA for each layer that, that you can use. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't have a more basic questions. So on the last videos uh, in the third videos, so when you uh, try to register your container to the Google Cloud uh, registry. So do you specify project ID instead of a project name? Is that- Yeah, it, be, it's, the, I, 
Yeah, it's the project ID. So every project has has a um, alphanumeric with, I think it only allows uh, like lowercase letters, numbers, and dashes or something like that. And so, so that's your project ID. And that's what goes into the URL with gcr.io. So in my case, my project ID is jw-demo. I think the project name is just called demo with a capital D, but I use the ID, which is jw-demo. And so it's gcr.io slash jw-demo slash and then my container ID that I want to give it and that could be anything that's okay. alphanumeric dashes mm -hmm. um, but yeah so that's that that middle part of that URL with the Google Container Registry is your project ID. But it asks for, uh, for the specific uh, permission uh, to set it in the project level so uh, what is the best way to access the permission for that project level? For the um, like for you as a user to be able to write to to the container registry like what what permissions do you need yeah um that one is actually it's it's kind of weird the way that that happens because the google container registry is based on on storage buckets in google cloud and so i believe that the that all of the permissions that you need are actually related to the the um, object storage and the ability to like create objects in in the um in the storage buckets and so there there is a documentation page which i'll i'll find for you that tells you what permissions you need but it, it's a little weird because a lot of services they'll have roles that are kind of specific to the service that allow you to do certain things but in this case the roles are not specific to google container registry they're actually roles about google container storage or google storage um, the google storage api so it gets a little bit uh confusing for sure so, but i'll find there is a documentation page that lists lists out the roles that you need so that you can write to the container registry so one more question to yeah related to the previous is that so what do you what is your best recommendation recommendation to put the right like, uh, the connection setup uh, for the other resources is it so Docker file use utilizing the Docker file as you recommend or some for like configuration information like yes. what what uh, database host to connect right. to that kind of thing yeah. so um, typically I use environment variables to do that uh, that's the nice thing about that is that. I like to be able to reuse a Docker container and swap out the environment that it's going to talk to. So if I'm, you know, have to have like an OAuth key or I have to have a, a microservice like URL that I'm talking to you or a database connection information, uh, if it's nice to be able to not change your Docker container, but be able to switch the environment around it. And the easiest way to do that is with environment variables because whether you okay. run Docker, um, on your machine or you run it in kubernetes or you run it in cloud run environment variables are the easy way to pass that configuration in and change it um, and so so that's usually the way that i do that there is another way that we're just beginning to expose using something called cloud secrets but it gets a bit more complicated and there's some nice security features to using the the secrets manager but but for me for most of the stuff i use the environment variables are, are a great way to handle that Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, good questions, thanks. And I'll see, I'll look and see if I can find that. Um, GCR docs. Um. Yeah, and while you're looking, I will allow just a little pause in case other people are thinking of questions before I dive into my next one, because I... <laughs> Let me just nice. ask all the questions if nobody jumps in. So, <laughs> cool. All right, there's. I just shared that page in the chat for uh, the the roles that are needed to to write uh, container images. Well, I have a question. Um, so, uh, in the past, <clears throat> I've kind of used Docker and have maybe built. All the services I need, and you know the application that's configured and it's run locally, and I've tested it and everything. And then I have found that then moving to the next step, which is like actually deploying to the cloud. Um, I've never used Google Cloud. Um, 
um, there was just a lot of friction there and a lot of things that um, were pretty difficult to debug and then understand, you know, even what's happening out. And so I was wondering if you could give me the short um, explanation or, or best practices for moving from your local Docker system yeah. and deploying that up into the cloud. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so the, the, the major idea with Docker was to create that portability across environments. But one of the challenges is that where you run your Docker containers is actually, actually um, potentially run through a whole different way of executing that Docker container. So like Kubernetes has its own way, its own engine for executing containers and Cloud Run has its own way for executing containers. And I think, uh, I think, Amazon has something called Firecracker or something like that, which is yet another way. So there's like all these different ways that those containers actually get run. And so you definitely can run into situations where the way that it's being run is different from the way that it's running with Docker run locally. And, and you can run into challenges there. I haven't seen, I haven't seen a whole lot of that um, in the stuff that I build. I think where where you can run into that more is when you start doing more lower level stuff. Like if if what you're doing is like talking to GPUs, then that's one case where it's like okay, the the way that you're talking to that GPU locally may be different than the way that you're talking to it in the cloud service. And and so so when you the lower level that you get, I think the more likely you are to to run into you to issues and weird things um, but generally like the the container should be portable uh, and it's it's likely considered a bug if if it's not uh, in in the actual runtime um, and in, in terms of ensuring portability uh, I think environment variables are a key part of that. There's, uh, you know, making sure that you have separated out your configuration from from what it actually needs. That can certainly help. Um, there's there's definitely cases where you you will uh, like mount a volume a file volume into a container, and you do that locally, and everything works. And then you go to run it, and it doesn't have that volume mounted wherever you're running it, and so then it's missing some files that it expected, and so so that can be a, a common uh, situation that that causes problems as well. Um, there's probably a few other situations that that more complicated things like if you get into what are called sidecars in kubernetes like replicating the the concept of a sidecar locally and uh, can be challenging and then like your sidecar is adding some functionality to your container and so if you're running without that sidecar or your, that sidecar is configured differently then you can run into portability challenges that way so um, so I'd say, you know, look out for sidecars. It can definitely be a, a place that opens up some, some challenges around portability. Um, and then like Cloud Run actually doesn't support sidecars. So that's, that's <laughs> if you want to run on Cloud Run, then you can't use sidecars. Um, so yeah, those are some things that come to mind. Did that help? Is there any other following questions to that? No, that was, that was great. Thank you. Cool. I have a question. We've um, run into, um, we have a Docker Compose set up. Yep. And that Docker Compose set up has a number of services and a number of things that are attached. Um, do you, is there any out, good out-the-box tools that you've found that can just port that Docker Compose set up into a cloud infrastructure well? <laughs> I haven't seen that and I, I want that um, because because it totally makes sense to not have to redefine that 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 like graph of things for deployment because you know you've got it set up locally why why should you have to like do that all again what uh, what I would guess exists, but I'm not sure about this, is it would be nice if Terraform could actually kind of be the, the source of truth for your graph. And then I would guess there's some way to go Terraform to Docker Compose, but I haven't personally looked into to that. But but yeah, everything that I've done around this requires basically duplicating the, the graph for local and, and even CI, CD, and then, and then also for production. Um, which is, I think, unfortunate. It'd be nice to have one shared kind of graph definition of of all the services and how they are related and the environment variables that they expose and share and all that kind of stuff. But, but yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it. 
it's super weird that we've all are going towards this microservices model and smaller and smaller and kind of, you know, get things to work together, but then we don't have a good way to have those things work together well yet. Well, good, well defined yeah. way of like defining that here and that going out. It's just like, yeah. oh, I have to find it here this way and then I have to find it there that way and then find it there that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I haven't spent much time with Terraform or Pulumi is the other option, but it seems like those are the two solutions that are kind of furthest along in this regard. And so I would look at those and see what they have for, for like uh, Docker Compose type of, uh, maybe they can generate the Docker po Compose configuration, or maybe you don't need it. Maybe, maybe you can, maybe it can somehow spin up the, what it needs, you know, based on the, the Terraform stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, Pulumi would be the other one. So I'd, I'd check really those out. Check that one out. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So um, I'd love to hear a little more about customizing Dockerfile or even, you know, I'm going to bring us back uh, down to the basics again. <laughs> but, um, you know, in terms of building one and, you know, kind of like tips and tricks is what people ask for when they're basically saying, I don't exactly know how to do it yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, just, you know, a little expand on that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to create the, the container images. Uh, the, the, if you're just doing like an app, you're building an app, and you have a pretty standard um, Python or Java or Node or whatever project, then build packs should just work and should just be the easy way to go from your source code to an application, uh, to a container that has your application and should do a good job of caching and you know things that you don't necessarily think about if you're just doing it all from scratch. Um, uh, layering is another important one, um, making sure that like cache and validation is going to work well because it's, you know, uh, layering dependencies in one layer and then your application in another layer, that kind of thing. So if build packs work for you in what you're doing, then I'd say just use build packs because it's the, is the, the simple, easy path. If, if you don't, uh, can't use build packs for some reason, and there definitely are a lot of reasons why, where you kind of hit the limits of build packs, then I usually just write a Docker file. Um, the most of my Docker files that I, that I write now are what's called, I think, multi-stage Docker files. Uh, and Docker added this maybe a couple of years ago or something. It's it's fairly recent in the, in the Docker, Docker ecosystem. But what it allows you to do is you say, all right, I'm going to start from this base image. Uh, so everything like starts from some base image. You say like from and then give it the, the URL to your base image. But then with a multi-stage one, you then say as and then some name. And so usually I say like as builder. And uh, and so, so then the next sequence of commands are all things that happen in kind of like a staged environment that does not go into my final Docker image. And so this is typical in anything that's like a compiled language, anything, any language where you have a build, I do it in this multi-stage setup. So I use Java stuff a lot. And so my builder is what actually is going to run my compile and create my jar files, you know, my, my actual thing that can run inside of the JVM. So I do all the steps necessary to, to build my application in that like first stage, the builder stage. And then I do another from and the next from is the run image, like like what my base image is going to be when I actually run the run my container. And so in that case, I don't need all the same tools that I needed to build the thing. I really, in in my case, I just need a JVM. If you're doing Node, then you just need the Node runtime, and like you need you as part of your in Node as part of your builder stage, you would install your dev dependencies, but in your in your like final stage, your 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 run stage, you don't need the dev dependencies anymore, and so you can actually like, you know, take take out stuff or uh, do a, a different setup so that you don't have the dev dependencies in your like production run image that kind of thing. But so in your in your run stage is where then you say, all right, now copy 
files from the build stage into this run stage. And so in my case with Java, I copy my created jar files from the build stage into the final stage. And then that's where you set your entry point that tells it what command to run when it starts the container. And so that's when I do Java minus jar and give it the jar file or whatever it is to actually run the thing. And so so I very commonly will use the multi-stage, when I'm writing a, a custom Docker file, we'll use a multi-stage build just so that my, um, one, I can choose a different base image for the build than for the run, uh, which is which is not always um, necessary, but is is nice to have a more trimmed down run image versus you know I may have a very large build image uh, that's needed to to build everything that I need. Um, so that's that's one nice thing about it is being able to select different different images at each stage to to be the base, um, and then uh, it's also nice to be able to like like clear out intermediate steps bef the, to not have them go into the final stage. Like ideally, I don't put my source code into my run image. Like it shouldn't be needed just the compiled jar files are needed. And so it's nice to be able to like clear those out. And I think that just makes me feel a little better about security or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, so multi-stage Docker uh, with Docker files is is something that I, I, I use quite a bit. Um, in terms of the actual like language that that you use when you write Docker files, it's a pretty small set of commands uh, that that um, that you use. There's like you can copy, you can run things. So like as an example of something to run, there are definitely times where I need to add some native package into my Docker image, and a lot of times I'm working with. Uh, Ubuntu based based images. And so then I'll say in my Docker file, I'll say run apt get update. Run apt get install minus y. So it like you know automatically says yes to the question of are you sure you want to install this? And so so then I'm installing into the Docker image because everything you run inside of the Docker file essentially is just like adding things, uh, adding modifications on top of that base image, and so and and so that's how I add packages in. Now there is a caveat to this, which is like one of the one of the principles of containers is that they should be uh, reproducible. So if I run Docker build on a Docker file today, and then I don't ever change that Docker file, five years from now, I should be able to run Docker build on it and get the exact same container image. But as soon as you start in your Docker file doing like app get installs or doing like I do curls or W gets to like, you know, pull things in, like all of a sudden kind of all bets are off whether that thing's going to actually be reproducible or not. So, but I'm like, all right, there's kind of no other, <laughs> no other way to, to do this. And so yeah, I'm sacrificing some potential uh, issues down the road with reproducibility, but, but necessary to, to talk to the internet, get some dependency, pull it in and put it into my container image. Um, so yeah, there's there's really only a handful of commands that that you use inside of a Docker file. It's a, it's a pretty pretty small DSL, but but going back to like if you can bash into a shell in a container, that's a good way to experiment with with making changes. Of course, as soon as you shut down that container or exit the shell, then all your changes are lost. But that's why you then. Uh, it just gives you a nice testing environment so that then you know what to put into your Docker file so that it, so that then you can recreate a container image that has those modifications in the container image. That's super that helpful. helpful. That was the one level deeper that I needed. Yeah, for um, because I am going to have to go out to pull that driver into my, you know, so I'm going to be doing that, you know, yep. not making it sustainable necessarily, but as long as it works for me right now, yeah. yeah that's the immediate goal so um yeah and then certainly with docker file language like i feel a lot less intimidated by that right just that it is as basic as i was hoping it would be to just sort of like you know get the container pull this in yeah and produce the 
Yeah, and the, the Docker docs are actually pretty good at like walking through the, the Docker file DSL and and how to use that to, to modify builds. And then also the it's pretty good at covering the the um, multi-stage builds, but I've been generally pretty impressed with the Docker documentation. It's it's um, some of the best I've, I've worked with. Like it actually covers usually like what I need it to cover. So <laughs> that's so important, right? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, what other if questions do you have? Over to Josh here. I don't know. I think we uh, we might be a little over time. I just realized. Um, uh, no worries. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, that was great, though. Uh, unless Anything there's any else? other questions, I think we can wrap yeah. up. Great. Well, thanks, James. I, I appreciate you offering your expertise to Go Code Colorado's competitors. Uh, for any access to any of the resources mentioned today, go to gocode.colorado.gov, and we look forward to seeing what you all can come up with. Thanks again, James. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And I'll be in the Slack channel, so ping me there if anybody has any other questions. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a nice day, everyone. Have a good one. All right. Bye.